Dear God, we accept the fact that we are going to mess up. We just want to take a moment to thank you for loving us no matter what. You see us as we really are in the simplest terms. You have grace, whether you are a brain or an athlete or a drama queen or a mastermind or a princess. Because failure isn't final. Good morning, Clear Branch. Man, it's good stuff when you see uh, ideas kind of come to fruition. This is something we've been talking about for some time now, the idea of kind of pouring some, uh, some 80s pop culture, uh, because Mark and I both are, are children of the 80s, and, and having that turn into an opportunity for us to, to build something like this that totally and utterly fits where we're going in the midst of this series. We're beginning a new series today. It's called Failure Isn't Final. Let's face it. All of us fail, whether we are a brain or a mastermind or a princess, right, or a drama, whatever it may be, failure affects us. And sometimes it affects us in ways that we cannot expect. And, and over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at ways that failure is an opportunity for God to work, perhaps in ways that he would have not necessarily been recognized in working without failure. You guys know how it is, right? Like things are going your way. Everything seems like it's perfect. You don't have detention on a Saturday. Movie reference, okay, strike one. Um, Things are just, they couldn't be better. And oftentimes in those places, we like to think, man, this is such great evidence of God being at work. And hear me say, yes, when things are going great, God is at work. When we are successful in life, is just going like we want it to. God is absolutely responsible and and, and able to be at work in those places. He's able to bring about even better things, right? But hear me say this too, and I'm not just saying that God is responsible for the places where we struggle, but that God is just as much at work in the places where we fail as he is in the places that we succeed. We cannot limit our understanding of God to think that somehow success is the indicator of God's faithfulness because it is not. Have you read the Bible? Countless times throughout scripture, we find people that have unbelievable level of struggle, oftentimes because they desire to take on that responsibility on their own to to be the ones who are in control instead of understanding that God is ultimately the one who was always in control. I think that's what we find in the vast majority of these stories that we're going to look at over the next four weeks is that things work out pretty well as long as we let God do what God does. And we have faith that what he does is is intended to be within the context of his plan and his purpose for our lives and for creation. But when we start wanting to hold on to the reins, to control where things go, to determine timelines, man... Stuff gets messy fast. I can't help but think about this in the context of kind of where we are in the world today. I know there are probably people in this room who are like ultra worked up over the things that are going on uh, between Israel and Iran. They were worked up over the, the eclipse last week. Hear me say this. God's plan is always at work. And though it is easy for us to get distracted and thrown off and hyper-focused on things that draw our attention away from the fact that God is God and that we are called to be his people, we must have faith that though things are outside of our control and our capacity, that they are never outside of God's control and God's capacity. I see lots of pastors who put things out online and I think to myself, have they read what they're preaching as people attempt to define timelines for all sorts of things. I was asked not long ago, Jeremy, are you somebody who believes in a pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation rapture? Tell me what you think. 
And I think I upset them a little bit because I said I believe that when it happens, it is God's will that it happens. And that though it would be really easy for me to get caught up in trying to figure out all the details, it's best for me to acknowledge that God is God and that I am not. And I'm best able to fulfill the role that I have when I'm focused, not on attempting to predict the end, but instead to proclaim the one who has been at work since the beginning and who will remain at work and in control and in power forever. That being said, we're not starting in Daniel or Revelation. We are starting in the Old Testament with a guy that we know as Abram, who becomes Abraham and his wife Sarai, who becomes Sarah. And we'll be looking at the places, and believe me, there are many in the people we will discuss in the next few weeks, but the places in their lives where they struggled to understand that God was in control and that God's timing and plan were perfect. So stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word as we read this morning from Genesis 15, 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your rewards shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Abraham's 75 years old when he's called by God to leave Ur of the Chaldeans. Hear me in this. Many people think, well, Abraham was the first Jew. Not really. Abraham had lived in a pagan culture, in a pagan world. At this point, there were no Jews. There were no Hebrews. God had called him out and set him on this course that would lead him through the promised land, that would take him out the other side of it, that would ultimately bring him back, that over the course of the years would change the the very nature of what it meant to be a follower of God. And so Abram is called and Abram goes and and at 75 years old he leaves Ur and 10 years later in Genesis 15 God comes to Abram and he promises him a son. And I'd like to think that at least for a very short period of time that Abraham got it. Like for 10 years he'd been following where it was that God had led him. He had seen God provide and show up and yet he promises him a son and I think that immediately it was what Abram wanted, it was what Sarai wanted and so they began to live into this expectation that God, when he tells you something, that he is gonna do it just like that. Note to self, scripture says otherwise in many instances. Sometimes God will tell us about a promise he has for us. He'll reveal these things to us. And yet we will somehow think that it's meant to happen immediately because God has said it. And then worse than that, because it doesn't happen immediately, we begin to question God's faithfulness and God's timing and God's plan and God's purpose. Are you hearing how this relates to where we are today? God does not tarry. God desires that all who can be shall be saved. God does not tarry when it comes to the story of Abraham who begins as Abram and who receives this promise and who waits for a period of time and then decides that he just can't wait anymore. 
And that's ultimately where we'll be focusing today. Yes, don't get me wrong, Abram had some instances where he was less than um, faithful to what it was that God had called him to, right? We know that Abram lied to Pharaoh, told him that Sarai was his wife in Genesis chapter 12. We know that he does that again after their names have been changed and she's Sarah in Genesis chapter 20 as he lies to Abimelech. All in an effort to try to keep them safe and make sure things are okay in his own power rather than having faith that God is going to bring them and provide for them and care for them and do for them the things that God desires to do and provide and care for. Abram has a tendency to think that he is responsible for being in control. And so when we encounter these words in Genesis 15, when we see that God comes to him and says, yes, I know that you want a son. You are not only going to be the father of a son, but the father of so many that it's like numbering the stars of the sky. This is covenantal, this is a promise. And yet sometimes in the midst of God's promises, it's not God who fails, but us who fails to be faithful. And we find this play out only a chapter later. Genesis 16, one through six, you guys know this story. Abram and Sarai conspire. They conspire because they are unwilling to wait for God's timing and they desire that they should have a child immediately and so what happens Sarai gives Abram Hagar her maidservant so that she can become pregnant and they can have a child note to self nowhere in God's promise did he say that he was reliant upon Abram and Sarai and Hagar to make it happen Nowhere in Genesis 15 did God say, hey, you do what you want to. I'm going to sit back here and watch. You got it covered. Then why is it that we think that our lives should be any different? That we should be the ones who hold on to control of what it is that God desires for our lives when instead he is calling us to be a people that simply say, God, your will be done in your timing. We will wait because you are God. Seventy-five, he's called out of Ur. At eighty-five, God promises him a son in Genesis chapter fifteen. And at eighty-six, not even a year later, he and Sarai take matters into their own hands. They were not a patient people, and I wonder if we are any more patient today. You see this play out, right? And one through six of 16, hear the word. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she, took, she looked on him with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her and she fled from her. Note to self. Even when we exert our effort and control upon a situation, it does not inherently make it better. Tell me you have experienced this in your life. Whether it's with your children or whether it's with your future, or whether it's with your job situation, or your spouse, the times that you attempt to work outside of God's plan and God's purpose is the time that you have the greatest potential for failure to be exponential in comparison to what it would be otherwise. 
And so Sarah and Abram have made this decision and we get to get a sense of what's happening here. Again, in the original language, as I often do, it kind of reveals some things. In verse 1, the idea of children, right, that had borne him no children, as we see in the first verse. The word there is yalad, literally the Hebrew word for children. It makes total sense. In 2a, the idea of bearing children, again, connected to the root word. This, this one is ladet, but it is the, the same concept, the same root. And you'll say, Jeremy, why are you telling this? Telling us this. Catch it. This is what happens in verse 2. In verse 2, no longer is it about yalad or ladet, the normal way of perceiving and understanding the word children. In Hebrew, it changes. In 2b, it says, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. This is Sarai speaking. And the word here is no longer broad spectrum, big word for children. Instead, the word here is banah. And bana is a play on the word ben, B-E-N, as we would say it in English. And ben is the Hebrew word for son. So catch this. Genesis 15, God comes to Abram and says, I'm going to give you a son and you shall be a father of nations. Right, you shall be a father that is has children as as broad and numerous as the stars in the sky. And in verse 2, it seems to me that Sarai had forgotten about the broader promise and had become focused on the idea that she may have a son when in fact she and Abram are called to be a father of many sons and many daughters. You see, in this moment, I would argue that Sarai and Abram both were very short-sighted about what it was that God wanted for them. They were focused on the one instead of being focused on the opportunity for many. And interestingly enough, the word banah is not the word for son, but it is the word of to be built up or to be edified or to be undergirded or established. They believed that their ability to become parents was greater evidence of their position as being upheld and edified than their faithfulness to the God who had brought them out of Ur and brought them into Cana and told them that he had a promise and a plan for their future. And I wonder what it is in our lives that we have exchanged something that is finite, something that is individual or singular for something that was promised to be greater because we could not wait. Are we still a people that are willing to take less than what it has that God has for us, less than what he promises us, simply so that we can feel like we are being edified and built up? Exchanging our wants and our desires and our will, supplanting them in place of God's. Because when we do that, Replacing our faith in ourself instead of our faith in the God who has created all things. God had made this promise. And they had grown tired of waiting. They had waited for less than a year since that promise had been made. And they thought, we cannot wait anymore. You know anybody that's a little impatient? Do not point to your spouses. Do you know about anybody that's impatient? Maybe we need to raise some hands for ourselves. And I'm not suggesting you have to do that, right? Thank you. But I mean, we are an impatient people. You see, what we wind up finding is that they take these things into their own plan and purpose, their own control. They go against God's will and his word and his way. And yet... Look what happens a chapter later. Genesis 17, one through eight. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make a covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. 
And then Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your covenant, my, pardon me, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come for you, from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant." to be God to you and to your offspring after you and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. Genesis 17. 99 year old Abram becomes Abraham. Abraham. And he hears God reaffirm this promise. And he brings it in to the potential, giving him the opportunity to understand that, that God is not playing, that God is not short-sighted. In fact, for the first time in Scripture, we in, encounter this name for God, El Shaddai. And it indicates the power and the omnipotence of God. And it's appropriate, I think, that it's introduced here. This almighty power which can override all opposing forces, even work in the midst of the places that we fail to bring about what it is that he has for us. Because when Abram and Sarai take things into their own hands, God does not leave them in a lurch. God continues to be about blessing and provision. God comes back to him and says, listen, you have got to hear this out. Understand this covenant and know that my will for you is what I desire to be done. I don't know about you guys, but at 45, I think I don't, I don't want to, I don't think I could handle another newborn. You know what I'm saying? Thank you for affirming that. If you did not hear that online, thank you for joining us. They laughed. And it's because they realize it's true. Abraham was 99 and God's like, you're going to have kids. If God said that to me at 99, I'd be like, are you sure? Like your will be done, but body's weak right and yet God brings these things about and he calls him to walk before him he calls him to live in a way that's respective and acknowledging of the blessing that God provides to him and then he tells him listen it's not merely a covenant between you and I but a covenant that I make with the fullness of your offspring See, Abram could only see through the very finite eyes of his humanity. And yet God could see through the very God-like eyes of his godliness, of his power and his might. He understood his plan and his purpose. And he's calling Abram out of this life of passivity into a life of, of activity. And he's encouraging him to faithfulness as well. He promises him that his will will be done. Ultimately, I believe that this is God encouraging him to faithfulness and understanding and a willingness to do what it is that God has placed upon him to do. To let go of the reins and the controls and to have faith that God is always in control. We've seen that this was difficult for Abram and Sarai and we know without a shadow of a doubt that it is difficult for us and yet God's faithfulness exceeds our limitation. God's blessing exceeds our need. And 
And God's promise is greater than anything in the world that we could ever bring about on our own. And for that, we should be thankful. You know that in scripture, I woke up Monday night. I'll tell you this kind of as a side. Monday night, I wake up at two in the morning. I cannot sleep. And the only thing that's going through my head is Abram didn't repent. Abram did not repent. And so I began to look through scripture and I found that the first time that we really find a patriarch of our faith that repents is David. Abraham's life was like, he was born about 22, 30 or so BC. David becomes king in 1003 BC-ish. And it's in David's writing of the Psalms that we begin to see what repentance looked like. That it's good for us to acknowledge our faults and our failures because in those moments, recognizing the brokenness of our choices, that we are often more apt to realize how much our dependence upon God truly is. The concept of repentance at this point in time was not present in the minds of those who God was working through. Not because it wasn't what God desired, right? But It was something that took time to develop for them to understand that they needed to have this this change of heart, this change of direction. So God is working to some degree in spite of the people who he's called because they themselves do not have a full understanding of who their God is yet. I tell you this to remind you that God works in our own limitations as well. Though he calls us to repentance, he does not desire for us or believe that we have to have. Like God's existence and power and might and his very presence as El Shaddai is not limited by our ability to fully understand what that means. And yet God desires for us to long for and to search for and to understand that he is a God of promise and a God of purpose. God is not limited by our limitations. But we are given the opportunity to experience God's goodness in spite of our failings, our shortfalls, and our limitations. And God even works in the midst of those places to help us better perceive the blessing and the plan and the purpose that he has for us. Here our last set of scripture, Genesis 17, 15 to 21. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people will come from her. And then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who's a hundred years old? Shall Sarah who is 90 years old bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, no. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. You see, Abram and Sarai made a choice. 4,000 or so years ago. And that choice ultimately wound up setting up the tension and the difficulty that exists within the modern world between God's chosen and covenantal people, Israel, and those whom God would bless because they were children of Abram and 
Ultimately, Abram called out to God and asked that he would not forget Ishmael. And we know that Ishmael would become the Ishmaelites and the Ishmaelites would become the Arab nations and that there's tension to this day as there always has been. As groups of people who came to God's blessing in very different ways fight for their place and attempt to control their own destiny rather than each of them realizing the blessing and the presence and the reality of our great God. And we believe that the Israelites understand who God is, that today's Israelis understand who God is, but that they have missed the deliverance that came through Christ. And yet they are still God's chosen people. And God is bringing about work in and through even us as Gentiles, people who are not Hebrew, and the profession and the calling out of the gospel to people of all nations for the blessing of God's kingdom. You see, God is at work and providing and blessing, but so many times we miss it or misunderstand it or misapply it or think that our desires and hopes and dreams and aspirations exceed what it is that God has for us. Abram and Sarah made a choice relative to Hagar and it set up conflict and difficulty and hardship. And yet God's covenant or Hebrew olam still exists through Abraham and Isaac. And God's blessing has existed through the people of Ishmael. Blessing or barakti as it is in Hebrew. That in spite of Abram and Sarai's failures, God is faithful. He promised them early on, you will have children as numerous as the stars. And he has brought that to fruition. God works. God is present and active in light of us and in spite of us. And I wonder if the story of Abram and Sarah provides us with an opportunity to recognize what it is that God is doing in our life. How he is active and present and working in the midst of the things that go right and in the midst of the things that go awry. In the midst of the places where we're faithful and willing to submit to God's plan and purpose and in the midst of the things that we feel like we have to hold on to and we have to control. How is God working in the midst of your relationships? How is God working in your life in spite of things like loss or death or divorce or cancer? How is God bringing about fulfillment of his plan and his purpose and his promise for you? Because I affirm and assure to you in this day that God is no less God now than he was 4,000 years ago. And God will always be God. And he will bring to fruition his plan and his purpose with us or without us. But oh, he desires to be at work in us and through us. So may we be a people that hear God's promises and covenants and plans And rather than striving to hold on to them with all that we are, may we say, God, your will be done. May we be a people that are content with God's timing and a people that are willing to wait 
Because when God plans something and puts it into motion, it is undeniable that his will will be done. So whether you're worried about where you are in this life or worried about what tomorrow may hold or worried about the things that you've messed up on in the past or concerned about maybe the mistakes you've made today, may you come to see God as the one who holds you in the palm of your hand and who loves you more than you could ever imagine. And whose plan for you today and tomorrow is to give you not only a promise, but hope in that promise. Allowing you to be partners in the coming of God's kingdom to this earth as it is in heaven. Today and always. Let us pray. Heavenly Father. You know our hearts and you know our desires. You know the things that we want control of and the things that we struggle to let go of. And Father, we are thankful for your patience with us. We're thankful for your faithfulness to us. And Father, we ask that you would help us to be a people that repent of the struggles of the failures and the people that have faith that you are able to work in the midst of the places where we get it all right and the places where we get it all wrong because you are God and you are not limited by what we can do. But oh, how thankful we are that you call us to be a people that are empowered by what you can do. Forgive us of our shortfalls. Help us to lay down the fullness of who we are, what we have, what we don't, all things at your altar, at the foot of the cross, Father. And in that, may we learn that you are working all things for our good. That you can turn the biggest disasters into the biggest blessings. to remember that our failure is not final. In Christ's name we pray, amen.